You're watching KRQE News 13 on Fox New Mexico. Historical accuracy with the anniversary of the atomic bomb being dropped on Nagasaki. We're going to take a look at the new film Oppenheimer to discuss how accurate the movie itself was in its depiction of the building of the bomb. With the summer blockbuster movie Oppenheimer and today being the anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki, we are now taking a look at the accuracy of the movie itself in portraying the creation and the legacy of the, the atomic bomb that changed the world history even from right here in New Mexico. Joining us to do so is our own celebrity historian, Rafi Andonian, who used to work at the Los Alamos History Museum and who wrote the book on the contested memories about the atomic bomb itself. Rafi, always good to have you with us. Of course, what a great anniversary, a meaningful anniversary to be here on, you know, the bombing of Nagasaki, as you mentioned, to talk about the movie and, and the legacy of the bomb. Yeah, absolutely. So starting off right now, so we know that Hollywood, you know, they're going to sometimes dress things up, maybe <laughs> omit some facts. Um, for the movie itself, how accurate would you say is it is? I'd say it's very accurate. Okay. Um, and, and I know Hollywood can take some liberties sometimes, but in this case, it was based on a biography, American Prometheus, which they refer to quickly kind of in the, in the uh, movie itself. But I'd give it a 9 out of 10 for its accuracy. Wow. There's some details we can kind of quibble over, but the overall thrust of the story, I'd say, is pretty accurate. And I'll give you a couple of key examples. One is the relationship between Oppenheimer and Groves. Of course, Groves being the general who's in command of the project from the military side and Oppenheimer, the chief scientist. Mm -hmm. And what, what you see there is a different styles of leadership. For example, you see references multiple times where Oppenheimer wants uh, to avoid the compartmentalization that Groves wanted, because Groves wants a compartmentalization because of security, so nobody gives away the secrets, but Oppenheimer, thinking like a scientist, wants to see the whole picture for everyone so that they can problem solve. Another great example of that, and this gets at the heart of the movie, I think, is the complexities and the different opinions of the scientists. There's a couple of different scenes like that. One is with Lily Hornick, which is the main female scientist that they depict in the movie, in which she's talking about, there's a scene, and Oppenheimer walks in, and she's talking about maybe we shouldn't use a bomb anymore, or, uh, because Germany surrounds and that was kind of our primary reason was racing with Germany. But then Oppenheimer steps in and says, well, Japan is still out there, and if you're a GI, you're not going to be thinking that way. That debate captures sort of what percolates later, which is a petition that they also referred to in the movie, where some scientists from Chicago and elsewhere were opposed to using the bomb in Japan. They wanted to use it only as a threat, but not the way that it ultimately was used. So that gets at sort of the scientists being kind of like the founding fathers. They all had different opinions in that circle. Mm -hmm. With it focusing on uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer himself, obviously, uh, he's, he's quite the character, if you will. I mean, you know, regarded as the top physicist in the country at that time, um, and for his, you know, obviously contributions to the change of history in the world. Um, and when you look at the man himself, and when you look at the portrayal on screen, how accurately would you say based on you know the the biographies and whatnot of him for what oppenheimer i think it's very accurate okay. and here's the thing is that during the war he was very much a man that was you know trying to push the war effort right he was very much committed to it um, despite his communist ties earlier which is part of the theme of the story later on he kind of shifts a little bit to, to policy positions that are more in favor of you know the arms treaty because he sees the potential rather than supporting the hydrogen bomb and you see that debate on screen too he's not for the hydrogen bomb being used and so that kind of plays out and that's one of the key conflicts in the movie with some of the other characters and the debate and the, co and the clash that they have and I'd also point out you know they capture his personality pretty well he's a complicated person like he was simultaneously arrogant but also very sociable he loved his martinis I brought the martini shaker and with his special martini recipe on there mm -hmm. has a lime juice and the honey which is what makes it special mm -hmm. uh, for Martin uh, for his um, uh, you know, recipe. So they capture him pretty well, I think, as a person, what he felt in his hand. Yep, the coasters with Oppenheimer on there. That's right. <laughs> his signature uh, <laughs> look right there. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And I would say that, you know, the way that he was both committed to the war during the war, but later kind of was dealing with the legacies. He says, I have blood on my hands to President Truman. That is true. And so, you know, that's part of what I get into with my book is kind of the, the legacies of the atomic bomb. And it's not just about war and destruction. It is also about nuclear medicine, for example, which has saved many lives. And, of course, nuclear energy, which is sure. both clean in, in terms of, you know, not having carbon, but also has an issue with the waste. So the legacies of the bomb, I think, are very com complex. The movie gets at that, and Oppenheimer himself understood that, and I think the movie captures that. So, again, some details I might quibble with, but the overall arc of the story for reducing it down to three hours, years of stuff, 
I think is very valuable to understand from nine out of ten. Absolutely, and, and, and it really is an incredible story. And just knowing that uh, New Mexico's ties to it, of course, you know, with the well, hidden That's city how he came here in part. Yeah. He liked New Mexico. He had a ranch in Pecos, or his family did, and he had been out here. He thought it was beautiful, but also he knew about the location being difficult to access and rural. The plateau is on a mesa, so mm -hmm. the plateau makes it hard to get to and easy to control access, which you want to do when you're doing a secret project. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing the movie gets a little wrong is they say there's really nothing up there they refer to the ranch school mm -hmm. but there's actually some homesteaders hispanic homesteaders up there and the ranch school and part of the reason they go there is because of that because they see about 50 buildings they say that'll be enough for the scientists we have infrastructure we can hit the ground running they turned out to be wrong they had to build an entire city but that is part of the reason that they heard the combination of infrastructure, rural, difficult to access, and the beauty of New Mexico. There you go. And by the way, that is a four ounces of good gin. Just so <laughs> yeah, make sure it's curious. high quality. <laughs> yeah. Rafi, thank you so much for joining us and all that great information. We appreciate it. Visit the Los Alamos sites. Always, yeah.